Welcome to Everything Co-op, bringing you information on how cooperatives can help improve your quality of life. This show is being sponsored by the National Co-op Bank, NCB. The NCB is dedicated to strengthening communities nationwide for the delivery of banking and financial services for the nation's cooperatives, their members, and other socially responsible organizations. For more information on the power of community ownership, visit ncb.coop. That's ncb.coop. Now stay tuned for your host, Vernon Oaks. Hi, this is Vernon Oaks. Welcome to Everything Cooperative. And this morning, I have the pleasure of having Mr. Rich Lowershell on the line with us this morning. He's on the program this morning. Rich has been on several times. Good morning, Rich. Good morning, Vernon. I'm so Vernon, I'm so happy to be with you this morning. Thanks so much for having me. Thank you. And with your 40 years of being in this cooperative world, I really want to start off by asking you, I mean, in the news today, yesterday, last week, last month, it's all of the conversation about uh, send them back. There are certain groups of people, religious, that were not welcome to the U.S. and tweeting all all about, you know, these negative kinds of things about different people of color or different religions. And how does that sort of fit with the co-op model, Rich? You've been around it a long time. Well, I've been around the co-ops for more than 40 years, and I can just tell you flat out, there's no place in the co-op business model for discrimination, for any approach that is not inclusive of everyone. I'm on the board of a startup co-op here in Fredericksburg, Virginia, and one of the things we say all the time is all are welcome. In fact, if you shop at a food co-op, you'll probably see a big sign, all is welcome. But if you go back to 1844 with the uh, birth of the modern co-op movement in Rochdale, England, a group of weavers got together because they couldn't meet their basic needs. And they developed co-op principles that we still live by today. The first of those co-op principles is voluntary and open membership. And the second principle is democratic member control. So just think about that for a minute. Voluntary and open membership. What does open mean? Everyone is welcome. Every, and what does democratic member control mean? Everyone is equal. Every member has one vote. That's, that's at the core, the bedrock of co-op principles. So that's the way we do business as co-ops, and it aligns with our values as humans. And that's just, uh, that's just what co-ops are all about. Just, just no room for send them back. It's uh, come on in, open arms. Uh, it's the co-op. Yeah, model. open arms, open arms, and anyone who wants to join our co-op, we very much welcome them in. I spent um, most of my career working for electric cooperatives. They do an outstanding job of providing electric service in mostly the rural parts of the United States. And if you think about their history. It's also a history of inclusion. It's a history of self-help, the history of democratic control, because if you go back to the 1930s, we tend to forget about this, but in the 1930s and 40s, the cities had electricity and the rural areas didn't. And the rural people were kind of like second-class citizens. Nobody was willing to provide electricity to them. And so the rural people got together, farmers and other people in the community, And they said, if no one else will do it for us, we'll do it ourselves. And they created their own consumer-owned electric co-op. And what was one of the fundamental principles of electric co-ops, it still is to this day, it is that everyone is served within their service territory. So a typical electric co-op will serve portions of three or four counties. Every single person in that area is provided service. It doesn't matter what religion they are. It doesn't matter what political philosophy they are. It doesn't matter what race or uh, any other characteristics. Um, everyone's provided service. And that's a, that's a core bedrock principle of every co-op. So a co-op is all about inclusiveness. And that's kind of who we are and you know, what, what co-ops stand for. And that's one of the reasons that I have fallen in love with this model, being an African-American growing up where I was not always included and I've gone into places. I grew up in the South, 
But I've also gone into places in the north and you could feel the tension. And I like that co-ops and this model is first principle. Everybody yeah. is included. Yeah. Um, the, although the first thing when I first got introduced with, to it is the first thing I liked about it was the fifth principle. <laughs> because I've taught mm-hmm. for 12 years yeah. in my life and I really like yeah. education, training and information, which is Definitely. the fifth principle of co-op. So it's like everybody's included. Come on in and get and train. Learn how to run a business. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And they tell me in the beginning in 1844, there was also teaching basic reading and math. It was uh, yeah. uh, all yeah. of the subject matters of here's what if you learn then you can better able to cast a good vote because you'll have the information you need to make yeah. a, a wise choice. So it, it yeah. fits. Uh, it's, it's so true. And with co-ops, these aren't just empty words. You know, we live, we live these values. And again, referencing my uh, little startup co-op here in Fredericksburg, the Fredericksburg Food Co-op, we will open our first uh, grocery store co-op next year in 2020 after about four years of organizing and building our membership. But during these four years, we've done a tremendous amount of education and training, education and training around the link between food and health, around best environmental practices, around cooperative principles, and who really are the owners of these co-ops, and, and how can we make sure that everyone is welcome, everyone you know, how do we include everyone? So those are the those are the principles that that we operate under. So it's discouraging uh, when we look at what's going on uh, in places where and in people's hearts that that don't have this feeling of inclusiveness. It's discouraging. But what we need to do as co-ops is follow the principles that we believe in and um, and help others to understand those principles because I think everyone. Uh, through education and training, you know, we can get the word out. We can we can foster uh, better knowledge. We can get people to rethink. If they don't have an inclusive approach, let's try to help them to rethink it. Let's have them think about different approaches to business, different approaches to life. And uh, so I think maybe that's why the co-op principles have always emphasized education, training, and information, because uh, it's such a necessary part of growing. It's such a necessary part of I'm doing the right thing. And I started, I learned about co-ops because I manage housing co-ops and I would see everyday people because most of the housing co-ops I manage were what is called limited equity co-ops. And they're for everyday people that perhaps could not afford to buy a single family house or a condo, but they could afford to come into this limited equity co-op. And then they had to learn how to run it, had to learn how to manage it. Uh, And to see everyday people sometimes with not even a high school education, make really wise, long-term decisions that's best for the group. Now, that's what, so that gets to be extremely yep. exciting. Yeah, it, it's extremely exciting. Uh, I love that about co-ops, that basically a uh, difference between a co-op and an investor-owned utility or a nonprofit is who's the owner. So you can have a, uh, you can have a nonprofit approach that oftentimes they do a lot of great work but it's usually controlled by a small group of people. Uh, And you can have an investor-owned model where it's controlled by the people that got the money to put up the capital. And and the co-op is fundamentally different from those. Uh, In a co-op, the owners are the members. So in a housing co-op, the owners are the people who live there. It's not like you're not doing something for someone else, like you're providing housing for someone else. No, those people own it. They control it. They make the decisions. And when you, when people do that, they make great decisions. It's, it's, it's really, I get excited even talking about it. When you watch people toy with tough decisions, uh, should we put on a new roof or should we, should we patch it? Tough decision. It costs a hundred thousand dollars. Okay. And, and really struggling with that and getting all kinds of data and going back and forth and then making a wise decision. It's, it's really, really interesting to watch it happen where, again, everyday people, not highly educated necessarily, uh, most of the time are not. Then limited equity co-ops, very, too often you don't find people with, with college degrees. Every now and then you'll find somebody. But they make really, really good decisions. And there's a payoff. And that's the third principle. 
you have to pay something to get in into the food co-op. What is it? A hundred dollars, two hundred. What's your pay pay in to get it's in? A, it's a it's a one time investment per household of two hundred dollars, but okay. uh, people can also pay it over time. Uh, they can do ten dollars a month for twenty months. I like to tell people that are thinking about joining. You know, if if ten dollars a month for twenty months is too much, tell us how how you'd like to you know make the investment, and because it's really an investment, it's not really a fee. It's not a um, you know it's not a charge. It's, it's an investment, and if they decide to leave the co-op, they can get the two hundred dollars back. So, you know, again, you do have to pay something to come in. This this is true, and that is another. As you said, that's principle number three, member economic participation. But, but you get uh, something back. That's the yes, other. you do. Not only do yes. you get your $200 back, when and if there's a profit or surplus, however you call it, that that can be distributed back to the members. Uh, I've heard three things that normally is done. It, some goes to the members, some goes to the community, and some is stayed in to help grow the business. But the yes. members decide that. How much goes to work? Yeah. Okay, and that's again what I like about. So there is a payoff for joining this co-op, doing business in this co-op, helping to start this co-op. There is a really payoff. There's some money you have to put in, some time. Most of it's time and sweat equity, and you learn. So you you yeah. You go ahead. <laughs> you tell no, no, no. That's exactly right. And the other the other thing is what what. Uh, so, in the case of our food co-op, which is typical of most of the 325 food co-ops across the country, um, so they make a one-time investment. But then, um, as, as you pointed out, when the store makes a profit, it's allocated back to the members based on how much shopping they do. Uh, number two, uh, they there are certain member-only discounts. It's very uh, usual for co-ops to have um, member appreciation days where they come in to buy their groceries and maybe one or two days a month, they can get a 10% discount or sometimes more. And then uh, the third benefit is that if they're a member owner, they have a say so they can run for the board and they also elect the board. So those are kind of the three tangible, the three, three tangible benefits. So there's definitely a payback. And the other thing about a co-op is, you know, it's locally controlled. So let's say, uh, around this country, we have a lot of food deserts, meaning that a big chain grocery store is not willing to put their money into a certain community because they don't think they can make a profit. Well, that was and, the reasons the farmers and the rural yeah. did not have electricity in the 30s and 40s. <laughs> that, that, because the big exactly, folks didn't do it. That's exactly right. And, R- and so, Rich, yeah, I, w- so, I want to stop you a minute. I'm sorry, but no we're going to have to take our first break, and I want to come back and talk more about this. You can start right, right, right where you started. But we started off by talking about what's happening in, in the, the news today with all of the hate and racism and stuff. And that's just no place in co-ops. And that's why I love co-ops and everybody out there would like for you to look up co-ops. You could look up the, the food co-op in Fredericksburg. There's right around here in the district, but there's 300 and how many you say, Rich? About 325. Uh, food co-ops uh, throughout and there's the rural elector and rural electors they they serve as about 80 percent of the land mass in the u.s so yes. it's, it's huge but we'll take our first break and we'll be right back please don't touch that down Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, W.O. at 95.9 FM. Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Cooperative. And we have Mr. Rich Lowershell on the line with us this morning, and we're talking about co-ops and what makes them great and why I, why I get so excited. And Rich has spent his whole adult life, at least 40-plus years, in in this world. And so we've talked about housing co-op, food co-ops, and rural electric co-ops so far. And there's another, and those are all consumer co-ops. Consumer meaning that the consumer, the people that uses the products or services, own and control the business. And another example of that consumer co-op is credit unions. So those are four types of consumer co-ops, and we'll talk about the other three types as we go on. But owning and controlling and uh 
Autonomy and independence is the fourth principle. We talked about the first principle. Everybody's included. The second principle is democratic control. One member, one vote. Third principle is member economic participation. You put something up in to, to play and you can get something back when there's a profit. And there's a lot of things you get back. And the fourth principle is autonomy and independence. You have to, co-op has to have control even from governments and from if a bank loans them money, they have to do it in such a way that the co-op members still have control and run that business. And that's what you were beginning to talk about, uh, Rich, before we took break was this sort of control piece. Yeah, well, the control piece is is really key, and it's really it's a differentiator between uh, co-ops and other kinds of businesses. And uh, you know, one of the things that I've been trying to do, I uh, I retired from working for the Cooperative Finance Corporation uh, at the end of 2013, and I'm really like a full-time volunteer now. But I'm helping to start a food co-op here in Fredericksburg, and I teach a class on the cooperative business uh, model at the University of Mary Washington, where I'm sitting right now. And so uh, this ties into the principle of education, training, and information, principle number five. When I was working for the electric co-ops and the finance co-op, I always felt that uh, we we as co-ops didn't do a a good enough job of getting information out there uh, about co-ops that, as as you said, Vernon, really co-ops are really a you know, a hidden gem. They do great work, and yet m- most people don't seem to know much about them. And um, I particularly felt that the college is a business where there's a lot of smart young people who are business oriented. Uh, co ops really aren't taught uh, in the colleges of business around the country. So I was very happy when the dean of the College of Business here at the University of Mary Washington, Lynn Richardson, asked me if I would teach a class on the co-op business model. And I've been doing that now with Adam Schwartz, where we co-teach a class about really helping business majors and others, but mostly it's in the College of Business, uh, helping them understand what a co-op business is. And from, so we're teaching this fall. We'll begin the last Thursday of August and go through December. Um, it's a regular three credit class. And most of the students in that class, we have 23 or 24 enrolled right now. They've never really been exposed to co-op businesses because they're really not taught. Uh, business colleges teach mostly the investor owned model, kind of the model of, you know, let's make as much money as we can kind of thing. And to a lesser extent, the nonprofit model is taught. But we're just so happy to have the opportunity to share information on what makes co-ops special, uh, why a student should consider a career with a co-op, and if they're thinking about starting a business, uh, just to have the co-op option on the table. So that's kind of, I know I tiptoed into principle number five there, Vernon, but I thought I would I would mention how through education we can spread the word about why does ownership and control really make a difference? Yes. Now, I, I've taught 12 years in my career. 11 at the college level. And I, one of the things I like about co-ops also is that when I go to annual meetings, whether it's a housing or food co-ops or in any annual meetings I've been into, sharing information, I go down to Federation of Southern Co-ops, which I'll be next Thursday. I want to do live from there. There's information flowing. Everybody gives it freely. Where yes. in the in the when I worked in corporate America, it is uh, you hang on to it because that, that's your secret and that gives you power over your competitor and so forth. Yeah. The information flows, and I and I like that. And I want to thank you because uh, I don't know if you remember, but last year or so, I asked you for your syllabus and you gave it to me within the hour almost. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I doctored it up and I sent it over to the dean of the business school at Howard where I had taught for five years. And unfortunately, he came back and said, he, he I don't know who he talked to, but he said that there was not a demand for it on at Howard's campus. And so I've been trying to reach students to see if there is a demand from students. And, and I don't know if he talked to students or if he talked to the faculty, but that's what he came back with. And it's nice that you got the dean to ask you. Yeah. Um, that yeah. That is wonderful. And I'd like to see if we could get more deans to, to talk about it, because I want to I want to teach a course like this in the D.C. area. I, I taught marketing 
uh, in the business school, and before that, I taught mathematics. So uh, this whole corporate world is like, that's phenomenal to be able to teach all of this. It's like, how can you get it all into a, one class would be the thing. Yeah. And before, I want to talk about your class and your syllabus and what you try to get accomplished. But I want to finish the, the two principles, the two next, the six and seven, which is another reason that co-ops work is because mm -hmm. the sixth principle is cooperation among co-ops. And how have you seen that work? Well, um, it's interesting that you should mention with co-op information just flows. So I'll just give you a couple of quick examples. When four years ago, we were considering forming the Fredericksburg Food Co-op. And so we reached out to um, Friendly City Food Co-op in Harrisonburg, Virginia, and our investigatory committee uh, made a trip out to Harrisonburg. And um, uh, that co-op is now eight years old. They just celebrated their eighth birthday. But they were about four years old. Uh, they were doing really well. And so I called Steve Cook. I had never met Steve. I didn't know him. He introduced myself. And he said, well, goodness, come on out. Uh, you know, love to see you and love to share information. So we, we, they hosted us. Uh, we had a nice lunch out there. They showed us all of their uh, facilities. And um, we had a good discussion about what we were thinking about doing, about what they were doing. They opened up their books and showed us all their information. Wait a minute. They opened up their books? They showed you oh, the yeah. money? <laughs> oh, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And uh, and then uh, we came back home. We had another meeting, and we and we decided to, we were going to go forward and incorporate. And so I, I called Steve, and I said, you know, really appreciate the information you share with us and the enthusiasm and the inspiration because it's always a mix of – information and inspiration and he provided both he's a quite an amazing man and um and i said you know we're trying to figure out how to file our articles of incorporation do you have an attorney you can recommend what do you think that'll cost us and he said well i'll, I'll do better for you than that so he he emailed to me a copy of his articles and he said use them any way you want mm -hmm. and so uh, we're filed, we filed for incorporation in the state of Virginia, just like they did. And so uh, we were just able to use his articles and, and change the name from Friendly City to Fredericksburg and and uh, probably saved a couple thousand dollars at a time. A minimum of a couple thousand dollars of legal fees, <laughs> plus the time and aggravation. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay. So that's just one, one example. Steve has not stopped helping us. Anytime I contact him or Bruce Flagar, who's the manager of the Roanoke Food Co-op, I contact them for information. Right away, they respond. Um, we've had meetings with the two of them. Those are the other two co-ops in, in Virginia, food co-ops in Virginia. And uh, so we've had meetings about things we can do together in terms of shared services. Uh, we're working to try to develop um, you know, what really will constitute a living wage here in Fredericksburg because we want to pay our employees well. And um, uh, Roanoke uh, Natural Foods Co-op has a uh, HR professional, Elizabeth. And so she's worked uh, providing a lot of data, coming up with an estimate um, for our community because we, uh, we don't easily have that same kind of talent that you know, she's a full-time professional in that area. So those are just a few examples. In the food co-op space, there's a group called the Food Co-op Initiative. Stuart Reed is the executive director of that, and Jacqueline Hanna is the assistant director. They, they have provided so much help to us. Really, our food co-op has just followed the model that they've laid out in terms of how, how do you do a food co-op. We could not have done this without them. We didn't have to reinvent the wheel. The food co-ops got together about 12 years ago. They knew there was going to be a wave of new food co-ops, and they, they put together this organization just for the purpose of helping new entities, new food co-ops form. So Co -op, cooperation among co-ops. Cooperation among co-ops. It's, it's, um, it touches your heart, and um, it's done from the standpoint of, you know, uh, you know, believing in the mission. I'll give you one other little example. I could go on all day about this. Well, Rich, save it after the okay. break, and we'll come back. And I also want to talk about after the break the up and coming conference. Great. So uh, save that other example, and we'll be right back. Everybody, I'll tell you, please don't touch the dial. Welcome. 
Welcome back, everybody. This is Vernon Oaks, and the program is Everything Cooperative. And we have Mr. Richard Lowrichelle online with us this morning. We're talking about the food co-op that he started and the work he's done with Rural, Rural Electric and the principles and values of co-ops and what makes them so great. Uh, National Cooperative Bank sponsors this program just to give you information about co-ops, the stuff that we're talking about today. And I really like the folks, Chuck Snyder and the people at, at the bank. They have been, for me, Rich, they have been a lot of information and tremendous inspiration. We've been on a, uh, on the line this year would be our sixth year, October. Yes, and we were only going to do it for one month six years ago. And they have inspired us and helped us to stay focused and keep growing this thing. So I really appreciate your being on, Rich, and you were talking about – well, I wanted you to talk about up-and-coming food co-ops, and I wanted you to give an, another example. Okay. I'll just give you um, – I'll start with giving another example. Let me just say about NCB and Chuck Snyder, they're a great organization. And um, another example of co-ops coming together and, you know, providing uh, needed service, in this case financing, to co-ops so so they can succeed in the marketplace around the country. So our food co-op is also working with NCB. And in fact, at noon today, we have a meeting here with uh, some of the staff from NCB. So I, uh, I know how you feel about them. And we're all grateful that that organization is, uh, is around and, and is a real resource uh, to co-ops. Roberta McDonald uh, did from yeah. Cabot Creamery. Oh, she's great. She called them. She calls them angels, so that she just mm-hmm. sums it up. <laughs> okay. Yep, it's a really good way of putting it. So I was going to give another example of um, of the spirit that co-ops have of helping new co-ops form and helping helping each other. And uh, when I was working for the Cooperative Finance Corporation, we worked with others in the f- electric co-ops uh, sector to help a community in Kauai, one of the islands in the state of Hawaii, form an electric co-op. Uh, the investor-owned utility was divesting of the property. They didn't want to own it anymore. And a local uh, group got together, and, and they wanted to form a co-op. And so we helped them. Uh, we, we made loans available to them, startup capital. We provided a lot of technical assistance. And the president of our board at the time was a gentleman you know, from the state of Minnesota. I remember when his uh, when his term was up and he was reflecting on the successes uh, during his time as the president of the CFC board. And he said the thing he felt best about was the work that CFC had done to help form the Kauai Island Utility Cooperative. And, and I use that as an example because this is a gentleman from Minnesota, <laughs> very far away from Hawaii. Um, and there was no personal benefit to him and no personal benefit to his co-op from the formation of a new co-op in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. But he felt so strongly about the co-op principles and how sharing the co-op business model with people even in a far-off place was so valuable that it touched his heart. And uh, I was always impressed with that. Let me just add something here before we move on. Martin Lowry, uh, who you know well, uh, was on his show, and he gave the story of how these Big burly guys who worked in co-ops and they would go to countries in Latin America, Africa to put down the poles and string the wires to help create a, a cooperative, an electric cooperative. He said when they came back, I mean, they were strong and burly and tall and that, and they would come to tear eyes when they talk about when the light flicked on and now kids can study at night. And, and, and all of the activities can happen in the home because they have electricity, and which we have forgotten about, but how yeah. this really touched the hearts of these men that went down and helped them. That's, that's, yeah. That, yeah, it's very teary-eyed to see what help we yeah. can do. Okay. Yeah. It's, it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. Um, so you were mentioning up-and-coming. Um, you, you, so you were referring to the up-and-coming food co-op conference? Yes. Okay, great. So that's another example of co-ops working together. So every year usually in around the March time frame, there's um, this conference, well attended. There's about 125 startup food co-ops in the country. The conference is attended, probably, I'm thinking, by about 250 people. Does that sound about right, Vernon? I went this March, and I would say 300, but that's 300, 250, okay. 300. Okay. Yeah, okay. Got it. Got it. So multiple people come from each co-op. We had four people from our co-op who were there, and... Um, 
And so it's a it's a wonderful learning opportunity. It's uh, basically two and a half days, and um, the Food Co-op Initiative and the Indiana Cooperative Group, uh, Deb Truk's group, put together a great agenda where they put in front of people like me and people from other startup food co-ops, really all the information we need to know about how you fund a co-op, how you organize a board, how you recruit membership, uh, what kind of systems you need to have in place from a a data tracking perspective, um, how to find a site, how to hire a manager, all of these kinds of informational things they put in front of us, the best experts in the field, and then also they put in front of us real people like us who are doing the work, who share their successes and failures. And um, so it's a great opportunity. I've gone to it now. Um, I think this is my, I've gone into it three or four times. Uh, Every year I come back with new information, uh, with something that I can come back, um, a whole team can come back, you know, and implement. And let me say, when you say, uh, you refer to me as starting a food co-op. I, I'll just correct you on that a little bit. Thank you. One per, one person doesn't start a co-op. Thank you. <laughs> and and so it's it's a, it's a team. And there's this old saying that if you if you want to go fast, go alone. If you want to go far, you know, go together. And a co-op is a group who wants to go far. And so so it's about doing it together. Sometimes together takes a little longer, <laughs> but it's more sustainable. Um, and so as a team, uh, so we have 1,185 members here in Fredericksburg. We have a nine member board. We have, oh, probably a hundred people who serve as volunteers, maybe more than that. And, you know, by being open to everyone's ideas and sharing ideas and having a common goal, we do a lot better than just one person doing it or two people doing it. There's so much we can get from you know, from working together, um, we build a sense of community, but we also surface the best ideas. And so at this conference, um, this is an example of education and training. It's an example of cooperation among cooperatives. It's an example of people like the Food Co-op Initiative in the Indiana Statewide and Calluminate and NCG and so many other groups, you know, sort of helping the whole community to grow, to prosper, to succeed because starting a new co-op like any starting any new business is not easy, but we have a tremendous value that we have each other and we can learn from each other. And so that conference is a wonderful learning opportunity. So I would encourage any of your listeners who are thinking about starting a food co-op. And I know that there's been some discussions uh, in the district about that, which I Mm -hmm. applaud. And uh, but attending that conference is uh, it's an eye opener uh, from an informational perspective. And it's also extremely inspirational to see uh, what other people are doing and then the networking. So I keep in touch with people I've met at that conference three or four years ago and we share information together. Just another example of how co-ops support each other. And the seventh principle uh, after con- uh, cooperation among co-ops is concern for community. And you've already mentioned that a couple of times. And I mentioned it when I said it's part of the money in a lot of co-ops is used for community projects to put into something mm-hmm. else other than food co-ops, but whatever the issue might be for that mm-hmm. particular community they're in. So what's been your experience with the seventh principle? You know, co-ops, uh, you know, definitely take that very seriously. So I was looking at some data that in the case of food co-ops, they donate back to the community uh, tremendously more than uh, than other grocery stores do. Uh, just sticking on the food co-ops for one moment, and, and the food co-ops are not unique in this. This principle goes across all the co-op sectors. But in the case of food co-ops, I was talking to Steve Cook at Friendly City, and what they do is um, so they donate a lot of food to food banks. I know you just had a uh, a little public service announcement about food banks and uh, in Friendly City and most food co-ops donate a significant amount to food pantries and food banks and things of that sort. Our own food co-op here in Fredericksburg, even though we're not even, our store isn't even open, we partnered with uh, The Table, which is a local food pantry at St. George's um, Church here downtown Fredericksburg, and we uh, we do a cooking class 
uh, once a month there, and we uh, we donate to the table. And we've done. Uh, Rich, I'm uh, sorry. I want to make sure I get this straight. You said you haven't even started your business yet, but you're donating food to the yes, food bank. Yes. Yes. Yeah. We donate money and we, and we do all that kind of thing um, because it's <laughs> okay. part of the. Co- so one of our basic principles of our of our Fredericksburg food co-op is to collaborate with others in our community to try to ensure that everyone has access to healthy local foods. And so, you know, the kinds of things that food co-ops do in those areas, which I think really make a lot of sense, there's a, a new food co-op started about four or five years ago in Durham, North Carolina. And, um, and this is, and what they're doing is something that our co-op, you know, is thinking about doing. We're not open yet, but uh, we'll open in 2020. But what they do is they, they, they provide 20% discount to anyone on SNAP. And so across the board, they can buy any groceries they want, and they get 20% off. Uh, they also do a $3 a meal, once a uh, three, uh, $3 Wednesday, I think it is. So every, I think it's every Wednesday night, or maybe it's Thursday, I don't know, but one night a week, they do a, a great healthy meal for $3. So uh, again, it's this idea that we started out with about being inclusive. Let's try to get everyone in the community to be part of this co-op. Let, let's make it easy. Let's facilitate it. Let's welcome everyone. Let's make the numbers work for them from a cost perspective. Whoever in our community has a need, let's do our best to try to meet it. Now, we can't do everything, but we can. That's why in our policies, we say we are committed to collaborating with others. Like, like we can bring something to the table. Others can bring something else to the table. Let's work together because we all want to try to solve these problems. And people are food insecure, um, you know, it's something that should affect every one of us. Um, and so let's, let's do what we can to try to make a difference. Those are just kind of some of the things that, um, you know, food co-ops particularly do. Uh, electric co-ops, which I have a background in, um, they contribute in countless ways to their communities. And one example is they very many electric co-ops have a roundup program where people round up their electric bill to another number and they uh, a little higher number and the co-ops take those funds. They have a member committee that um, defines uh, important uses for those funds in the community. Electric co-ops also provide scholarships uh, to students in need uh, so they can continue their education. There are so many ways, you know, when you back away from the specifics of what co-ops do and you say, how could they accomplish so much when they're smaller than investor-owned companies? And, and, and I think, to me, it's an example of if you're clear in your own mind as a co-op business what it is you want to co- accomplish, what your mission is, and you keep working on it, over time you'll be surprised by the vast amount that's accomplished. The vast amount that's accomplished. We're going to go to our next break and come back. I want to talk a little bit more about your course that you're teaching at the University of Murray, Washington. Excellent. And you talk this real quickly. The values of the co-ops that I like, the ethical values are honesty, openness, concern for community, and concern for others. So that's what's in the values that you just talked about. But we'll be right back. Information is power. Well, on the first month that we were here, one of my guests says, it's not information that's power. Information is stored power, just like gasoline is stored power. It's when you put action to the information. That's where you get the power. When you put action to the gasoline, is where you get the power. So the National Co-op Bank is sponsoring this program to give you the information with the hope that you will get into action to start your own co-op, to go and find a co-op like the Fredericksburg uh, Food Co-op that's going to open up next year and shop at that co-op, become a member of that co-op, help to run the co-op, get your voice to be heard, uh, and to help the community. Rich, 
I want to. You asked this question last. Do you like what you're doing? I want to ask it right now. Oh, oh, yes, I do. Yes, I do. I'm. Uh, I'm a really a full time volunteer. I was blessed to be able to work uh, for co-ops for for forty years, and so um, after forty years, I decided to retire and just have a time in my life when I give back uh, to the community and in other ways. And um, but I keep gravitating to co-ops because co-ops are a wonderful way of giving back to the community. So I've I've been enjoying uh, I've been enjoying this time in life. I got it, and I knew that was going to be your answer. So let's talk about this class now in this last segment. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe we can talk. What are what are what are you trying to accomplish in the class? Well, fundamentally, what what I'm hoping is that students uh, students in the class will will really have two. There'll be you know two outcomes. One will be that they will have a good solid understanding of what a co-op is and how a co-op is similar to and different from other kinds of businesses. And then secondly, that they will be empowered to think creatively. So when and if they decide to start a business, that one of the options that they think about is forming a co-op. Those are really my two objectives. Okay. I like this. uh, this, I I like both of them, but I really like the second one a lot of being able to think to be empowered to create a, a business and maybe even look at a cooperative business. Yep. Okay. Yep. So uh, we organized a class around that, and um, I don't want to interrupt you if you were going to ask a question, so let me pause here. No, I was going to ask you that let's just maybe go to the syllabus. So I see week okay. two you talk about food co-ops yep. as yep. a key to consumer co-op, which we've talked about here. Yep. Yep. And you um, you bring guests in. You have a guest for that show. Yeah, we do. We do. So, uh, so what we're trying to do is, um, if we step back and look at the class, so we're trying to to put in front of them, uh, you know, uh, information about all four types of co-ops, as you pointed out: consumer-owned co-ops, producer co-ops, you know, worker-owned co-ops, purchasing or shared service co-ops. So there's basically two ways of of conveying that one, you know, we have, we have good reading materials, we have good course materials and they can read all that stuff. And, and, you know, we expect them to read it and and we're going to quiz them on it. (laughs) We're going to test them on that. But we also put in front of them some of the best inspiring leaders in each co-op. So they can, they can get a feel for who are these people who are, who are working in the co-op area? Who are these people who are creating co-ops? And, you know, the depth of knowledge of someone like yourself in the housing co-op area, and, 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 and we appreciate that you're one of our guest speakers, but the depth of knowledge that someone like you will have about housing co-ops, they can't find that in a book. So they can, they can, um, they can learn by reading. They can learn by listening to Adam Schwartz, who's a wonderful, wonderful uh, co-op guy, and myself. Uh, they can learn from us listening and lecturing, but then they can also get up close with people in the field. So that's that's what we're trying to do. So in the first half of the class, the first half of the semester, we'll provide them with information about the four types of co-ops. We'll give them a, a midterm exam to question their understanding of that, to, uh, uh, you know, figure, figure that out. In the second half of the class, they're going to be actually developing a business plan they're going to, we're going to break them down into little teams, and each team is going to develop a business plan for a co-op that, that they envision creating. Um, so they're going to end up the semester with a business plan. Usually for these students, it's the first business plan they've ever developed. And we actually have, we're working with the small business development uh, group here in town that's affiliated with the university. We have a wonderful uh, individual there who actually will meet with our students, Susan, Susan Ball, and, um, and she'll walk through with them, you know, how do you develop a business plan? And uh, so they'll end the semester with a business plan for a co-op. Okay, so I want to go back and break it down a little bit in yep. the last few minutes. So we talk about consumer co-ops, and that's where people that use the products and services. So you have housing, rural electrics, um, mm-hmm. credit unions. Yep. And food co-ops. Food co-ops could be uh, a worker-owned co-op or a could consumer be. co-op. 
or yeah, hybrid. Could be, yeah, it could be a hybrid, yep. So yep. worker co-ops then are any business that's owned and controlled by the employees. If it's owned and controlled exactly. by the employees, it's a worker cooperative. So those yep. are the two main ones that I talk mostly about. But then you have what you call the, well, let's, the purchasing co-op and, and mm-hmm. farmers have used this a lot and others are beginning to use it. You said purchasing or shared services. So they, mm-hmm. the, the group of people will say, we need to buy fertilizer, gasoline, or we need to buy space. Uh, and mm-hmm. uh, we can afford to do this if, and we can get a better price and a lot better quality if we do it together as a group. And so they form a co-op, and that's right. what farmers have done for uh, quite a long time. Right, right. So basically, a producer, a producer owned co-op. So uh, we have examples of that. For example, uh, Organic Valley. Oh wait, see, I was talking about purchasing first. Okay. I was talking okay. about the purchasing, purchasing side. Okay. Got it. <clears throat> so purchasing co So we have like Ace Hardware is a purchasing co-op. It's a, it's a shared services of purchasing co-op. We have Gina Schaefer, who uh, she and her husband own a number of Ace Hardware stores in the district and in the Washington area. And she'll be with us actually on September 26th talking about how, how Ace Hardware works. So, so there's two kinds of shared service co-ops, if you want to look at it this way. One is where the members are um, independent businesses. Ace Hardware is an example of that. Another kind of shared service co-op is one where the members are cooperatives. So my old organization, the Cooperative Finance Corporation, uh, will have Sheldon Peterson, a wonderful guy who's the CEO of CFC, and his members are electric co-ops. Um, so they're another shared services co-op. The service they provide is financing. Okay. And, and NCB would be another shared services co-op, for example. Because because their mem- their members are are co ops and they're providing a service to their members. You know, sometimes I forget that NCB is a co op itself. I do forget. Yes, that. yes, okay. yeah, definitely, definitely. So, well, you know, uh, and then and many of us do. Like we can be a member of a credit union and not realize that a credit union is a co op. We can we can buy from Ace Hardware and not realize that that they're or REI and not realize that they're part of a co op or. We can be served by an electric co-op, and, and we just think we're it's an electric company. But if we if we drill down a little deeper, there's a rich, beautiful picture that we can become part of. And you mentioned REI. That's a consumer co-op that does yeah. uh, equipment, uh, recreational mm-hmm. equipment. Mm-hmm. Yep. Okay. Absolutely. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. Now I want to go to this producing co-op, which a lot of times I'll talk. I call it a marketing co-op. So, uh, mm-hmm. you, and you mentioned Organic Valley, Cabot Creamy, Ocean yes. Spray. Um, so, yes. those are some examples of those. So, you have anybody yes. in that world coming in? Yep, we do. We have uh, Jerry McGeorge uh, from uh, Organic Valley, and he'll be here. He'll be with us on uh, on October third, and um, he'll be sharing the Organic Valley story, where a group of farmers got together and they formed their own co op to really market their organic products. In the last week of the class, we have Roberta McDonald and Sarah Wing. You mentioned Roberta earlier, and I agree with you. She's a wonderful person. Uh, they're from Cabot Creamery Co-op, and, and they'll be with us really talking about, you know, about marketing, how, how co-ops can market their co-op advantage. So if somebody wanted to take this class, uh, could they do it as, you know, just come and take one class? or they have Sure, to be a... sure, sure, sure. What would they Someone have to do? could... Yeah, they could contact me um, or they could contact you and you could put them in touch with me. And I'd be happy that people come in and sit in on a class if they're, if they're interested in a particular class. Absolutely. If someone wants to enroll in the class, they need to go through the university. And there's ways of doing that. And I would be receptive to, you know, allowing someone to, you know, to register. The University of Mary Washington in Fredericksburg. Yep, yep Absolutely. Rich, uh, we're almost out of time. What's your last thought? <laughs> well, I um, first of all, let me say how much I appreciate what you do, Vernon, uh, in, in, in terms of, of getting the uh, information out there about uh, about co-ops, uh, education, training, information. We talked about the fifth principle, and what you're doing every week is really uh, taking that and you know putting it into action, and that's extremely valuable. And I just appreciate the chance to be on your show, to chat with you. I've always enjoyed having the chance to visit with you. So 
Thanks. Thanks for inviting me. Okay. Thank you, sir. And on your last, on page six of your syllabus, you have online resources. I request you put www.everything.coop on there. Okay, consider it done. I will do that right away. Everybody out there, please have a wonderful week and live cooperatively. Washington, D.C.'s News Talk, 1450 AM, WOL, 95.9 FM.